Welcome, Paula. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss When the Stars Go Dark and everything else in your amazing collection of work. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. And I just want to thank you for being such an advocate for books and authors, an ambassador, an ambassadress, if that's Ooh, a word. I'll take but it. Seriously, we, um, I just want you to know that it really matters to have, you know, real people out there who love books and community. And um, anyway, I believe books connect us. I believe all that stuff. And so thank you. Oh, that made my day. Thank you so much. I also believe books connect us. And uh, um, I feel like stories are so important. And I mean, look at the way that you took this book, right? Like I was on the edge of my seat reading this book to the point where my husband's like, what's going on over there? You know, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, wait, don't, don't talk to me, right? We can't have dinner. Hold on. We're like, you know, in this big crime scene and whatever. No, I take that as the highest possible compliment. I mean, that's why we read, right? I mean, when I was a kid, that's totally why I read to get lost in the world, right? Um, We think of escape as something with negative connotations, and yet it has such powerful positive connotations as well, if we give it half a minute, right? Like this year, for instance, haven't we needed books to escape? And also to just give us a connection to something else, something bigger than ourselves, right? Stories that inspire us, stories that feed our soul. I mean, sometimes even entertainment to distract us for that hour or two, for instance, from things that are heavy or stressful is I find it meditative. I mean, it's sort of like yoga, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the only way to literally get somebody else's voice in your head and displace all of your own sort of conscious thoughts for a minute and delve completely. Even when I watch a movie, it's not exactly the same thing, right? Because I'm like, where's my popcorn? And like, you know, I can still like do other things or like attend to something, but in a book. book, No, it just grabs you and pulls you in. And I always think too, that is what meditation does, right? And mindfulness or even yoga. Like if you're in a yoga class and you get super sweaty and suddenly you realize the reason you feel relaxed is because it's turned off the, the loop where you're reminding yourself of the million things you need to do or all the anxiety you've been feeling about your parents or your kids or your lists and the lists with the lists and the addendums to the yes. list. Yes. <laughs> Lists I email to myself, lists I keep on the side. Yes. Exactly. Totally get it. exactly. Oh, I'm hearing a lot and we're doing a lot. And I believe that we have every right to need a great story every once in a while. So it is. It's a treat. And by the way, yoga does not do that for me. So I'm kind of jealous of that for you. <laughs> yoga is like, I am so self-conscious. I can't even do yoga by myself without having my interior monologue going like nonstop. So yeah, yeah, I don't think you're alone. I think it's like in moments, like in little moments, I can't even do meditation without having the, right. That's part. I can't even do meditation. End of sentence period. (laughs) (laughs) But books, I can read book after book after book. Um, Uh, Yeah. And it's true. You don't even know where you go. Like the person sitting next to you doesn't know that like all of a sudden I'm in the woods or like I'm in this, you know, the the eggs are being burned on the stove and now like my heart is pounding and the dog barking and the police coming in. And I'm like, I am going through all this right now, except I'm not, except I'm sitting on my bed. I don't know. Yes. So I I constantly marvel at this, all All of that. that. So, (laughs) so Paula, you have an, an author's letter at the beginning where you talk about the fact that you've sort of switched genres, right? That you don't, you're obvious, you wrote The Paris Wife, which was amazing, obviously. Um, and now you've sort of moved into this more haunting thriller esque, although it doesn't, it's not really like a thriller, it's more like a mystery. Yeah, like literary suspense. Yeah, mystery, that's a better word. I guess is what it is. But um, none of that was premeditated. I, um, I got hijacked. I was in the middle of writing my third historical, which is called Love and Ruin. And it's another Hemingway novel. Um, But the character at the center is really Martha Gellhorn, who is a journalist who is his third 
wife. She was a war correspondent and an utter badass. So I'm in that world. I'm in Madrid, right? Franco's army, they're in the trenches, like all this crazy stuff. And I went for a walk with my dog, which I do every day, twice a day, because I'm a really good dog mom. And I need that too, for that thing we were talking about, about getting out of your, getting out of your head and putting things down for a bit. But I'm on a walk with my dog and suddenly this character flares up, this detective character. And um, it happens sometimes. It happens sometimes, particularly on dog walks or like, you know, in the shower or in a long car ride or something. I believe that, I don't know, whatever pulls that some rhythmic quality to the movement or that, that invites inspiration. That's what I think it is. I don't know, it's mysterious. Did you ever read Liz Gilbert's Big Magic? No. About, about creativity and what, what it is and where it comes from, but it's mysterious. So here was this character that just came out of the sky. And I pictured this missing persons detective who is troubled, who has, who's caring a lot. And this uh, girl who um, vanishes in thin air and the connection that they have. And I knew that it had to be set in Mendocino because it's a place that really matters to me from my connection to California. I'm a California native. And by the time I got home with the dog, I could see the whole thing. I could see the whole thing. It was like this shimmering, electrical, magical thing. But what do I know about suspense, right? So I'm just like, crazy idea, crazy idea. I put it down, but it came back. And I put it down, but it came back. I put it down, but it came back. So I floated it to my agent and she's like, oh my God, yes, 100% yes, 900% yes. Maybe it has to be a series. Mm. Um, and so I decided I would try. It's not easy, right? It's not easy because I was afraid, you know, it was great to have my agent on board. She's my number one reader. She's the person who sort of reads all my drafts and stuff. But the publishing company, Random House, right? My editor, all those people who actually pay me. <laughs> I was afraid to tell them because I had carved out a successful career for myself. And so my agent said, and this was scary too, don't, let's not sell, let's not sell them on an idea. Let's not say Paula McLean is going to try to write a mystery now. And there's a detective, see, and a missing girl. And uh, she's like, write it, write it the way it is in your mind, write the hell out of it. And then we'll show them that book when that book is done. And so that's what we did. But for a year and a half, as I was drafting, I was, t it's like, jump just jumping over a cliff I was terrified can I really do this you know all the voices right the broad anxiety the right what am I taking on am I completely out of my mind over my head out of my depth but along the way it was so exciting <laughs> it was so exciting because I was learning something new like my brain was firing on all cylinders the way it does when we learn something new. And so I had challenged myself, right? I had challenged myself and I had taken the ceiling away. It had been 10 years since I had allowed myself to spin out a tale about an entirely imaginary character. So my whole creative process suddenly was re-energized. So what did you tell your, the Random House people when you were secretly writing another book? <laughs> Did they think you were just like, you know, whiling away they, the time? Yes, they thought they knew I was working on something new and that I wasn't talking about it. That I wasn't talking about it. She's not ready, basically, is what my agent kept telling them. She's working. It's exciting. We can't wait to show you, but she's not quite ready. And so it was just thrilling when we finally did show them and they were convinced and on board and persuaded and no one, not any way up the line, not publicity, not marketing, not my publisher, no one along the way said, what is she doing? They only said, yes, this book. So felt amazing, felt amazing when you take a risk, right? When you take a risk and they pay off 
comes, you know, just with this, with this yes. Well, it was meant to be. I mean, you had, it was a story you had to tell. It was like, it, it was yours to tell. You couldn't not tell it. I think so. Thank you for putting that language to it because it did start to feel that way the deeper I got. I didn't know on the dog walk that I was going to give Anna Hart, my detective, my experiences in foster care. That was like the third draft. I didn't know, but the seed was there. The seed was there to write a character who maybe I had more in common with, right? Than Hadley Richardson, Hemingway's wife, than Beryl Markham, this kick-ass aviator from colonial Kenya, right? <laughs> Suddenly the stitches can come more naturally. We're imagining a character and they're, um, what they're wrestling with, right? Like we all are wrestling with the past, our regrets, trying to make sense of our choices and our lives, trying to move forward um, and understanding what keeps us from moving forward, you know? Wow. I wonder if people outside of sort of the literary community would view what you did as, as big a risk as you felt like it was. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, I understand how, like, when you're so firmly entrenched in like a, a genre that it feels like life changing. More that like, dramatic, like yeah. much more dramatic to me. Like some people might think like, well, yeah, she's an amazing author. She can write whatever she, she wants. She can write whatever she wants. Right. I mean, I guess I would say, I don't think writers feel that level of just utter freedom all the time, particularly if you have a franchise, mm -hmm. right? So let's say Lisa Scottolini has just written a historical, mm -hmm. right? Yep. But she's made her name doing something entirely different. What will her fans think? Will they be able to have the creative, you know, the imagination and the to follow her into that realm? Or would they say, this is not who she is. This is not what she does, right? But this is like, you know, watching your favorite actress all of a sudden go from comedy mm -hmm. to drama. Like, that's okay. I'm going to watch her no matter where she goes. Yeah. And and she's probably yeah. really good at both. Yeah, I, I think you're onto something though. I think we as writers might have our own limitations more than the ones that exist. They might be in our head. I, I, I'm not saying it's all in your head. I'm just saying, I think that readers are more flexible. Right? Yeah. They, they love how you write. They don't yeah. love what, maybe maybe they're not even that <laughs> into historical fiction, but you're maybe, such a great oh, writer. Right. Maybe it's the right. So that's super interesting. At one point, I remember having a um, crisis of confidence, like this big, I'd written, it was, it was like the first draft still. And I'm like, okay, so now I have FBI guys and I don't know how to write FBI guys. And like, do I have them all in a room but I don't wanna write that book. And I, this was a conversation I was having with my agent. And she's like, sweetheart, you're not writing a procedural. You're, you're writing about people. That's what you do. You write about people. So just do that and you can't go wrong. Yeah. And that's what we do. In, in the end, when you boil it down, we're telling stories yeah. about people. And you're asking all sorts of questions. I mean, I think that's a large part of this book is like, you know, Anna sort of sitting on the floor with, um, now I'm not gonna remember, the friend who's, the, what's the name of the friend? And he's like in the beanbag in his room and she's like oh, sitting there. Oh, Gray like, Benson. Gray yeah, right, Gray Benson, sorry. The friend of Right, and you can just see that like, so she's down there and she's like, I, you know, she's getting it out of him. She's like, I'm listening, I hear your story. And that's what the whole thing was, is like, she can put herself in the, in the, in the, any missing person's shoes because she has things that she can relate to. And it's all about like different moments of empathy and listening. And that's just like the human experience. That's why I was like, it's not really a thriller per se, because it's this quest for answers, which, at its core, we're all sort of looking for in some way, shape, or form, right? Yeah, yeah. So not a mystery, but about mystery. Yeah. The mystery of being human. And thanks for the insight and sort of getting that moment between Anna and Gray, which is one of my favorite moments in the book because it shows what her gifts are, right? And that he, he needs to unburden himself. Like he actually needs to put it down. 
And maybe no one's really listened to him in that exact way before right? She connects. And yep. she connects. And one of the reasons that she connects is because she's experienced childhood trauma. And this is something I have in common with my character. I experienced childhood trauma too. And I believe it has everything to do with my empathy and the empathetic imagination and why I'm interested so much in people and what they do and why they do those things, right? The good and the bad. The good and the bad, you know? There's no such thing as a 100% hero. There's no such thing as a 100% victim or, or, or villain or any of it, right? That we're all shades of gray. There's always complexity in the human story. That's what I'm interested in. And I think you show that a lot with your character, Hap, how he's always sort of trying to show yeah. the darkness and you know point out the risks but doing so in a moment doing so out of love right like it's all leading the way can also be just shining the light on the dark mm, that was very poetically said yeah oh, yeah so hap is one of the characters that came to me immediately when i i didn't know why like who is this guy you know, writers sometimes say, they, my characters just started talking to me and that usually doesn't happen. But um, here it kind of did. I'm like, okay. And um, I think Hap might be the father I wished I had had when I was a kid, right? Who understood me and who understood that I needed um, not pity, right? But space to trust myself, space to trust myself, to become competent, right? At one point, Anna says about Hap, he was a wise man. He'd already learned how to talk to me, survivor to survivor. That scene in the car was insane. Yeah, right? oh, thank you. Yes, yeah, so he's teaching door. her skills for how to survive in the woods. And she's a kid who's been really... She's gone through the ringer emotionally. She's had too, way too much loss and people have given up on her. And so he, un, he intuits really. Mm -hmm. She needs not, um, he doesn't tell her, you know, that she should trust him. He doesn't think that she should immediately sort of give up all her secrets and right. People have layers and they become this, he becomes her North Star, essentially, right? Yeah. And then interestingly, you have his wife who also has these visions and you have a medium who's also, who, you know, you're tuning into so often. And I like totally believe in that. I don't know if I should admit that, but like I'm, I, I've like <laughs> talked to okay. a medium, I'm this all in. Safe, this is a safe place. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not sure I could have put a medium in the book if I hadn't also. And whether I believe or not, I have had experiences that I can't explain rationally, right? So if Hap is her connection to the natural world, mm -hmm. Eden, her foster mother, who is a sort of like a modern day mystic, is her connection to the ineffable. Everything that's bigger, right? And I think they really provide this interesting balance. Also, Eden does this remarkable thing, which is that she forgives Anna, right? Mm -hmm. For all of her mistakes, because she knows that humans are infinitely complicated. So basically she invites Anna to give herself kind of more of a break and to kind of forgive herself for the things that she's carrying around, the, the pieces of her past. And, her regrets. Yeah, I love these people. I mean, you can tell, right? I mean, they they feel incredibly real to me. Well, you made them very real. I feel like, I don't know, I feel like there's this alternate world where all the characters <laughs> of all these books live. And I'm like, just spending the years, like getting to know all the characters. I'm like, what, what no. planet am I living on? But I could actually like, Hap and Eden could walk in and, um, you know. Maybe it's like the good place. Yeah. Right, Eleanor in the good place. Maybe that's heaven. Like we go to heaven, and all of our favorite characters are. Oh my gosh, wouldn't that be cool? You get to choose Dylan. the room of like which book yeah. you go into, and you know. Anyway, um, 
Wow. Well, I know you've referenced your own past in your modern love article. I was like, oh my gosh, like this piece that you just wrote was so, I mean, I, I was like holding my heart reading it the whole time. I can't believe what you've gone through as a child. I can't believe how amazingly you could write about it in just like the way you can evoke feeling in the reader and like put yourself right there and then also turn it into this book and all the things you're doing and having gone through that, like my heart just broke for you as a, as a child. I mean, yeah. and it's so brave of you to like put it not brave. That's such a cliche word, but just, um, it's so. Oh, it is. I mean, it is, it does take courage to be, be vulnerable. I mean, Brene Brown, right? Can I get a witness? It takes personal courage to sort of stand up and say, these are my, this is what I'm dealing with, right? These are, we all have something. There's nobody that gets through life without being wounded, without suffering. We all suffer, right? We just don't talk about it. And so, you know, childhood trauma, sexual violence, it's all around us. It's everywhere. It permeates every level of our culture, society, uh, across cultures, in, ev in every part of the world, to every age group. It's everywhere. And so, but we never talk about it. We're terrified, I think, of how dark it is. But what you were saying about HAP, right? Sometimes all we can do is shine a light on the dark places to give voice to these things that are all around us. And well, but back to Brene Brown really quickly, she says, you know, shame cannot survive the light, right? So that's empowerment. Talking about it is empowerment. Even if those conversations aren't, you know, I wrote an essay millions of people read, right? But sometimes it's just conversations between women. It's telling your best friend or your sister or, right, each, your daughter so that she understands this is part of your story and that telling that story and giving voice to it is a way of taking up some power, right? And shining a light on that. So I don't know, I think it's positive. I, I, it's positive to talk about it. It makes us super uncomfortable, but you know what? We're already uncomfortable right now, right? I mean, everything we've been through this year, all of the uncertainty and fear, all the tensions around race. And, you know, we're being invited. We're basically being bitch slapped too by the universe. Like it's time, the environmental stuff, right? It's time to have these hard conversations because it's already here. We're not, being in denial is not going to um, help us. It's not, that's not the way to move forward. No, but taking, someone like you who already has such an audience, you know, as you feel is for your, <laughs> for your current novels, I think it's just for your writing, but um, to, to have someone like you be a, a leader in that and saying like, okay, well, here's another way I'm going to open up. Like, what do you, like, what do you have? Like, what's, what, yeah. you know, like, now it's your turn, right? Imagine what yeah. would all come out. So, yeah, it is a little more, it's definitely more exposing because what I've done is connect the dots. I've clearly connected the dots between my own personal story and what I'm writing about. And I've never really done that before. So for instance, friends of mine who read The Paris Wife find it incredibly emotional because they know that I was going through a divorce at the time that I was reading, but nobody else is gonna know that, right? Yep. Or Beryl Markham lost her mother when she was four. I lost my mother when I was four. People who know that about me know that that was my emotional connection to that character. But the world at large isn't gonna know that. So mm -hmm. here it's like all the veils are kind of, all the veils are falling away and I'm just being more open about it because I think it's, it's a conversation we need to have and because I, it's the same way as it be. I don't like to make small talk, you know, at a cocktail party. To me, that's just like death. Like I want to have a deep, rich conversation about all this stuff. Me too. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the stuff. Right? Let's talk about the stuff. I love it. Um, 
Wow. And then like obsessed with this, if you wonder with this kombucha, (laughs) that's what I'm drinking. That's my little treat right now. I'm having this conversation with you and I'm drinking um, ginger blood orange kombucha. Amazing. I'm drinking uh, blackberry infused hint water. FYI, I actually look like I'm done. So that's good. That's my water for the day. (laughs) I've seen that around and I've seen all the boxes around. It's good. Water. Is it good? I really actually the founder was on this podcast. Her name is Kara Golden. Um, and she wrote a book called Undaunted, which is good. And actually, speaking of other books, um, have you read Renee Denfeld's The Blood The Butterfly Effect? And do you know Renee? Oh, yes. Isn't she amazing? All right, good. Because I was I like, Did you gonna... read her first book, The Child Finder? I never read The Child Finder, but I read The oh. Butterfly Effect. Okay, put that on your list. Okay? I will. It's yes, it's on my list. Exactly. So one of the reasons that I really admire, and I thank her in my acknowledgements. Oh, I missed it. Yeah. I never, I've Usually never, I read them first. I've there, never no, you know what? Her. This is why. Acknowledgements to come in my- Okay. okay. Acknowledgements yeah, There we okay. go. Yeah. So because she, she talks about the stuff. Mm-hmm. Her characters are empathetic. They're, they're, flawed, they have wounds, and their wounds connect them to mm-hmm. everyone around them, right? So she has a missing person's, it's not a detective, um, a, a child finder, essentially. And the reason that she's a child finder is because she herself was taken as a child and escaped, but has no memory of the past. And so it's that same thing, right? It's the, it's the, the thread that connects us. Mm -hmm. So what, what advice do you have to aspiring authors? I don't want to take all of your time, although I could talk to you about this all day. No, this is really fun. Yeah. We'll have to have a sequel sometime. Yes. Um, Advice to aspiring writers is always follow your obsessions because they will lead you someplace rich. Never think about other people's stories and what they're doing. Never try to chase the marketplace. Never say, oh, I'm going to write a historical because that's selling, or I'm going to write a domestic thriller because that will get you in trouble every time. Like, what's calling you, right? What's the thing? What are the stories that's been over and over in your head? What are the characters, even from your past, that you can't quite, that girl, right, in high school, or that, whatever, a childhood friend, or some conversation you had that is continuing to speak to you, like write about those things and then read your face off, read your damn face off. I mean, a young writer who doesn't read is doomed. Nothing's going to happen. You can't write in a vacuum. You have to know it's possible. And I always have my, um, my council of elders, you know, the books that I have around me that are my dearest friends. And of course they terrify me because I could never right at that level, right? You have these things, these books that are just so beautiful, like um, Michael Cunningham's The Hours, Mm -hmm. for instance, is a book I love, or um, uh, I'm just trying to think of another, it doesn't really matter, whatever those books are, have Marilyn Robinson's Housekeeping. It's a perfect book. I have it around me and I pick it up and Elizabeth Strout's my name is Lucy Barton. That was great. Mm-hmm. Talk about a book that's talking about the stuff, mm-hmm. right? Not just entertaining, not just telling a story, but then doing that too, right? I believe the balance has to be there. You don't want to um, lecture people. You don't want to proselytize or get on a soapbox. Mm-hmm. But if you can tell a page turning story and get people thinking, about, for instance, their life's purpose. Like, wouldn't you wanna maybe have that conversation too? Because books can do that. Books feed our soul, right? They're the deep stuff. I completely agree. And I feel like your book, and I'm not just saying this, like what you did those things with this book, When the Stars Go Dark. It was masterfully written and really beautiful and memorable. And I'm glad you went there. So thank thank you you. so much. Your support means everything and you're a delightful person. Thank you. you. So, so onward, keep reading, right? Keep reading your face off. I will. I will keep reading my face off.
All right. I'm grateful to you. Take okay, care. Take care, Paula. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.